When you think of the term JRPG, what games come to mind? For some, games like Persona will jump forth due to their recent popularity, and for others, the historical importance of Dragon Quest may come to mind. But I would wager that no other series is more popular in this regard than Final Fantasy. In the West, Final Fantasy has been an enduring staple of the genre that is constantly innovating and trying new concepts to get people interested in their games. Recently, we've seen a massive rise in interest for JRPGs with the success of games like Persona 5 and Dragon Quest XI. But while these titles may be popular, neither can come close to the endurance and longevity of one of the most impactful JRPGs of all time, Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy VII is no doubt an important game. A quick Google search can tell you exactly how people feel about it. And if we look at the numbers, this game easily trounces most other JRPGs in its class, with a whopping 18 million copies of the original title sold. But while I could talk at length about reasons for its success or its impact on the American market, what I really want to look at is the characters of Final Fantasy VII, and how they manage to be realistic, relatable people, even by modern gaming standards. Because that connection I feel to the characters pulls me in more than anything else about the game. Now, seeing as the game contains an inordinate amount of characters who each have their own development and characterization, I'm only going to have time to discuss my very, very favorites. So with that in mind, let's start at the top with my absolute favorite character, Cloud Strife. Lots of role-playing games these days seem to be enamored by the silent protagonist, a blank slate for the player to project themselves onto. Now, this kind of character can prove useful for immersion, and it certainly has its place in gaming. But I've gotta say, it feels increasingly rare to see an RPG main character that is also a fully fleshed out character. However, as I said, this kind of character can work pretty well, and upon booting up Final Fantasy VII for the first time, it seems like that's exactly what the game has in store for us. From his first scene, Cloud appears to be quiet and cold not particularly interested in sharing his thoughts or feelings in favor of leaving that to the player. This continues to hold true for much of the first act, but the facade is constantly being eroded by small interactions and character choices that we get to see early on. While most games with a silent protagonist will give you options to come off as either very kind or more edgy and brooding, Cloud always seems to come off as a bit on edge or cold. Very seldom do we have the chance to see him just be chill and go along with things for the hell of it. And when you do, Cloud will probably have something witty to say about it. At first, this may not seem like much, but this is genius because it is subtly characterizing Cloud in ways that will be expanded upon later. But in the meantime, it's attaching you, the player, to him as the main character as a conduit for yourself into the world of the game. But if Cloud gets such good characterization, exactly what is it about him that is so great? Well, I'm glad you asked. From here on out, minor spoilers for Final Fantasy VII Original. Nothing super major, but if you're one of those kinds of people who only likes to experience things completely blind, then here is your minor spoiler warning for a 23-year-old game. Anyways, once we're out of Midgar, we get to see much, much more of Cloud's personality. But more importantly, we get to see his past. Cloud is a character wrought by grief over his past failures particularly one to become a soldier first class and in his eyes live up to his promise to Tifa. This pushes him towards the stone cold personality of bravado characteristic of a typical soldier. But in reality, it's a front constructed by his trauma and pain two concepts that have a firm grip on Cloud's life. This characterization is perfect for Cloud because it makes his silent demeanor from the start of the game a consequence of his past rather than an arbitrary character choice to make him relatable to the player. Instead of a blank slate, we're given a deep and flawed character that has a strong personal connection to the events of the game instead of just some guy. Cloud is a shining example of a solid main character with proper stakes, but he is bolstered even more by the a supporting cast that helps him through his trauma and accompanies him on his journey across Gaia. One such companion is Tifa Lockhart. Tifa is often described as Cloud's emotional rock, a constant in his life there for him in his darkest moments. From the days he spent in Nibelheim to when we see him during the events of the game, Tifa happens to be a permanent fixture of his life. She's characterized as a thoughtful, level-headed member of the party that has Cloud's best interests at heart because she genuinely cares for him. 
But what I really like about her and the other women in Final Fantasy VII is that while she can be caring and soft, she isn't ever seen as a damsel to be saved or someone who needs Cloud to come and rescue her. She is absolutely more than capable of handling herself, and to put this on display, she's one of the few human characters that fights giant monsters and literal gods with her bare fucking hands. Tifa is the perfect blend of sweet and badass without feeling too much like a caricature of either trait. We also get to see a more complex side of her when Cloud begins to explain his memories of Nibelheim and Sephiroth. As we know from Final Fantasy VII, Cloud's memory is broken due to his trauma surrounding his past. After getting out of Midgar, he recounts what he remembers from Nibelheim five years ago, with many details incorrect, and he inserts himself into the role of Zack, who is omitted from the story entirely. Now, obviously, Tifa was there, and her memory is in far better shape than Cloud's, so she could come right out and tell him he's wrong right then and there. But instead of doing that, she listens to him carefully and feels conflicted. She understands the pain that Cloud has suffered through, and she doesn't want to hurt him further by pointing out his broken memory. But at the same time, she realizes that he will have to confront the past sooner or later. This inner conflict really puts Tifa in a tough spot, and watching that play out is really interesting and adds a lot of emotional complexity to an already well-written scene. It was at this moment in the story where things really felt like they were taking off for me, and I think one last character really drove it home for me. Barrett was not a character that I took to at first. Upon first inspection, his demeanor and personality seemed to be typical of a character that wouldn't speak to me under usual circumstances. He is big, strong, and very, very masculine. Which is great, but I typically feel less connected to these types of characters as they often come off as flat or one note. So for most of my playthrough of the original game, I kept him out of my party in favor of other characters like Aerith or Tifa. But much like Cloud, this character is one that becomes more and more interesting as time goes by. As we've established, Barra is characterized by a strong sense of bravado and macho-ness. This leads him to be the natural leader of Avalanche, or at least the small sect of it that we see in the game, and it pushes him to be much harder on Cloud than anyone else. While at first this may come off as frustrating or annoying, if we take a closer look at the character, we can see some deep underlying reasons for his less-than-kind treatment of our first-class mercenary. As we come to learn, Barrett is a father, and he has seen quite a troubled life. Before Barrett joined Avalanche, he lived in a small mining town called Coral, and he was married to a woman named Myrna. Myrna? Myrna, I guess. But unfortunately, Myrna was suffering from a rare and fatal disease. This led Barrett to lead Shinra soldiers into Coral to either build or fix a Mako reactor, I don't remember which. But this was done in an attempt to gain some power and possibly save her life. Suffice it to say that things did not go exactly as planned, and he ended up losing both his arm and one of his closest friends dying to Shinra soldiers. Swearing to protect Dine's now orphaned daughter Marlene, Barrett takes her in. After this, the two move to Midgar in order to join Avalanche and make things right. This tragic series of events follows Barrett and haunts him in his day-to-day -day life, but he knows that in order to take best care of Marlene, he needs to be strong, set a good example, and work forward to do what is right by those who he lost. This backstory directly informs the tough guy attitude, and gives it a sense of depth. Barrett isn't compensating for anything, or just tough for the sake of tough. He is trying to stay strong in order to protect his adopted daughter, and make sure that nothing like what happened in his past will ever happen again. So when he and Cloud first meet, it's only natural that Barrett treats him with suspicion and doubt. He can't fully put all of his trust into an ex-Shinra grunt who doesn't seem to even care about the mission that he's been hired for. The way these two interact becomes so much more interesting than just two tough guys, because it runs much deeper than that. Cloud and Barrett are set up to dislike each other at first because of their past trauma and hardships, that still control certain aspects of their lives. But over the course of the story, we get to see them overcome those difficulties and deepen their bond. By now, I'm sure you can put together what it is I'm trying to say by deconstructing each of these characters. Final Fantasy VII is so much more than just a collection of tropes and archetypes brought together to deliver lines and beat up bad guys. Each character has a specific lore that holds not only a past from which to draw stories, but also a backlog of emotional centerpieces of their life 
that hold weight over every character choice in the game. Each person in the world of Final Fantasy VII is informed by how their life story interacts with their current situation. And because of that, we get to see realistic interactions that feel packed full of meaning and emotional consequence, as opposed to weak interactions that serve no function other than to push a narrative forward. If it weren't overtly obvious, I really love this game. I love the characters, the world building, the message, and even the somewhat antiquated gameplay of the original title. I think in the future I will revisit this title to look at characters that I didn't have time to examine, hint hint, but for now I should probably just leave this video here. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the video. First, I just want to say thank you guys so much for getting me past 100 subscribers. I know to a lot of you it probably doesn't seem like much, but it really does mean a lot to me that I was able to hit this goal by the end of the year. It was something that I had in the back of my mind when I started making videos in, like, June, I think, and I'm just so stoked that I was able to do it. Of course, be sure to like the video and hit the subscribe button as usual, but today I really just want to say thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.